Hello and welcome back to Monster Monday. On today's episode, I'm going to be kicking some spooktacular little guys. They're called Blights. Okay guys, if you check out the lore behind Blights, you'll find out that they originate from this whole story about a powerful magical vampire named Golthias. And I remember from an adventure uh, with a bunch of buddies, an encounter involving a Golthias tree and all sorts of cool things. Blights are awakened plants. So whether you use the lore or not, or you make up the lore to fit your setting, I think that Blights are really cool. And they're kind of a cool option to use in a lot of different places. By default, you usually think of blights as something that you would encounter in forests or um, traveling through the hills, but some kind of outside in nature or maybe even in swamps or marshes. But I think that they could be used even in more like urban settings, you know, like a, a small village where maybe there are blights uh, that, that have kind of grown in population for whatever reason that you could weave into the story that you're, you're telling. Or maybe, you know, these blights have taken over a nearby castle or the ruins of a castle. So I think there's a lot of potential. And dare I say, even in cavern adventures or you know, in dungeons that I could see blights even even working out. A lot of it goes back to kind of the adventure that you're trying to tell or the the arc of the campaign that you're, you're sort of weaving. But um, I think they have a lot of cool potential. There are several kinds of blights. There are needle blights, twig blights, and vine blights. A twig blight is uh, probably the, the smallest and kind of lightest weight of the, the blights. It's considered a small plant with an armor class of 13. 1d6 plus 1 hit points. So easily something that you could throw a few of these guys into uh, a first level adventure very easily. Could you use twig blights with higher levels? Absolutely. Um, by scaling them up, by adding some hit points, may maybe boosting their armor class or even just making their attacks a little more impactful, twig blights could be a threat to a mid-level party. At the most basic level though, they have blind sight for 60 feet they have false appearance, so while the blight remains motionless, it is indistinguishable from a dead shrub. When you are describing the scene in which you plan to use these things, you have to kind of describe it fully. So, as an example, you wouldn't say something like this. As you enter the courtyard of the castle, you see nothing but some dead shrubs. That's going to give away your, your surprise attack, if all you mention is the dead shrubs. If, however, you describe... Um, overgrown grass and weeds, a bunch of dead shrubs, and the walls crumbling, the masonry starting to crumble. If you get more descriptive and you include that reference to the dead shrubs, but you include other things in your description, then your party might not be so quick to jump to the conclusion that you're about to attack them with blights. And I would say that strategy is a good strategy for any GM or DM add in a little more description to encounters and to locations so that your party and, and the players themselves are actually challenged. They're challenged to imagine the scene that you're setting so that they can immerse themselves in the characters that they're playing. Their claws, Twig Blight's claws, are plus three to hit and they do 1d4 plus one piercing damage. So not a particularly tough little guy, the Twig Blight. Definitely fun for low level. If you wanted to scale them up for mid level, you can add hit points, um, you can increase their armor class, or, hear me out, you can have their claw attacks do a little more damage and or add poison to the effect. So every time they attack, uh, if they hit successfully, they do a certain amount of damage plus 1d4 poison damage, and you have the uh, victim have to make a constitution saving throw DC 13 or 16 or whatever you want to make it so that uh, they're not suffering the poisoned condition, which is actually really inconvenient when you're a party member. If you've been poisoned, it, it has a pretty strong impact on how you function. So that that's a way to kind of scale up the twig blight to make them a little more meaningful or impactful. Another variation on, on that would be you make one super twig blight who has like the poison ability and more hit points like a boss and then a bunch of little ones so that you can make it a little more challenging but not like wipe out the party. 
Okay, let's take a look at needle blights. Needle blights are uh, armor class 12, 2d8 plus 2 hit points. All the same, you know, blind sight, all that kind of stuff. They have claws, which is their melee weapon attack, plus 3 to hit, 2d4 plus 1 piercing damage. And I guess that's probably because they're a medium um, plant, so that kind of makes more sense. And then they have needles, so this allows them to have a ranged attack, which I think is kind of cool. Plus three to hit, their range is 30-60, so it's like a thrown uh, weapon, and it's 2d6 plus one piercing damage. So if you have some needle blights, um, you know, who are attacking the party, maybe they're guarding something very specific that they don't want the party to encounter, and when the party gets within range, they start attacking with their needles. If the party engages them in melee, then the Needle Blights would defend themselves with their melee weapons. One other thing, though, that's that's kind of funny. Uh, I'm, I didn't mention this, but Twig Blights have damage vulnerability to fire because they're basically like dried shrubs. So damage vulnerability to fire means that a, a clever party might use a fire attack on them, which would be more impactful and would probably kill a Twig Blight with one shot. Like, you know, even like a Firebolt Cantrip could probably knock out a Twig Blight with one shot. So, uh, but Needle Blights, interestingly enough, do not have that vulnerability. Maybe because they're not dried out, maybe because they're green. The last of the three listed Blights is the Vine Blight. Armor class 12, 4d8 plus 8 hit points. Um, they do not have any damage vulnerabilities. They do have false appearance. So again, like while the Blight remains motionless, it is indistinguishable from a tangle of vines. Where could you use vines? Anywhere. Anywhere. You could use vines on the walls of a castle. You could have vines growing in a cave system, almost like roots growing from the ceiling and down to the floor, and maybe they're, they're tapped into like a little pool of water. Um, you could have vines growing in ruins. You could have vines growing in a jungle, in a marsh, in a swamp, in a forest, on hills and on mountains. Vines can be anywhere. You could have vines growing in the well of a farmer. You could have vines growing up from underneath people's houses in a village. Armor class 12, 48 plus 8 hit points. Constrict. So their melee weapon attack, plus 4 to hit, with a reach of 10 feet, does 2d6 plus 2 bludgeoning damage, and a large or smaller target is grappled. Escape DC is 12. Until this grapple ends, the target is restrained, and the blight can't constrict another target. At challenge rating 1 half, that still, it's, it, it would be a challenge for like a first and second level party, but it wouldn't necessarily like TPK them, right? So how would you make a vine blight more powerful to maybe challenge a mid-level party or even a high-level party? Number one, you increase their armor class. Make their armor class 18. Make the vines thicker. Make them have some kind of, you know, barky exterior that's almost as tough as stone. Add way more hit points. Um, and then also, make the escape DC more than 12. Because like a 12, that, that's not even hard. Like anybody with a moderate dexterity modifier is probably going to be able to escape or strength uh, either way. Um, they would be able to escape that grapple. So make the escape DC for the vines um, constrict something like DC 16. That would automatically make a vine blight into a mid-level encounter creature. The other thing that they are able to do is entangling plants. So grasping roots and vines sprout in a 15-foot radius centered on the blight, withering away after one minute. For the duration, that area is difficult terrain for non-plant creatures. In addition, each creature of the Blight's choice in that area, when the plants appear, must succeed on a DC 12 strength saving throw or become restrained. A creature can use its action to make a DC 12 strength check, freeing itself or another entangled creature within reach on a success. That's a recharge 5 or 6. So if you're not familiar with recharge, some monsters have abilities that they can only use uh, when you roll a D6 you have to roll a five or a six in this case for them to be able to use it. So in theory, they could use it every round, provided that you roll a D6 and you roll a five or six on that D6. As, as it's written, the Vine Blight is a great kind of boss mob for a first level party. But if you needed to scale them up in addition to increasing their armor class or boosting up their hit points, um, I would make that entangling plants thing 
a 30 foot radius and I'd make the DC 16 because that's going to make it a lot more challenging, right? And at this point, when it has all these roots and vines that sprout up and entrap the party in difficult terrain, uh, it can then indiscriminately send out more of these things to constrict. You could even say that it has three constrict attacks instead of just one. In theory, you can make a vine blight that is like a big bad end guy. That could, like, if you boost the stats up, you write your notes out, you have a series of these vine blights that surround kind of a, a place where the party's trying to get to. Maybe they're in search of something important, they're on an adventure, they're going to this destination, or they're going to like rescue someone. And there's a whole bunch of vine blights that have surrounded the final location and are protecting it, right? For whatever dark power they serve. A lot of, lot of really cool opportunities here. And you know what, from a DM sharing the spotlight perspective, blights are also a great way to allow a druid to have their moment to shine, right? A druid or a ranger. But basically like, you know, a ranger or a druid have a lot of spells and abilities that allow them to do cool things in nature, right? Like move through difficult terrain without it being difficult terrain, for example. And I think that these these blights kind of could create certainly a cool encounter, but I feel like you could build an entire adventure around just the blights. Why are they there? What are they doing? Who do they serve? What are they protecting? What are they guarding? What is making these blights so much more powerful than other blights? Is it a vampire? You could reach back to the Golthias lore. Or maybe it's something even more nefarious and high level, like a lich. Or an evil druid. Oh, evil druid. Those are some ideas. I think blights are really cool because they're so versatile. Because you can use them at low level, mid level, and yes, even high level. But I will tell you that if you decide to scale these up, make notes about what you're doing to scale them up. Don't just do it on the fly because that's kind of on the level of cheating. So at the very least, make notes about what you're changing, write down the stat blocks, hit points, armor class, the attacks, the damage, all of their special features. Make some notes if you choose to scale these up so that it's fair and that do your, do your due diligence as the GM. Try to make sure that you're balancing this encounter with your scaled up blights to be fair but challenging to your party. And everyone will have an awesome time at the table when you do that. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Monster Monday featuring the Blights. Make sure you tune in for the next one. And thanks, as always, to those of you who support me on Patreon, without whom I would not be doing this. Happy gaming. Well, Dave, I don't know. How do you get a D&D player to go out with you? You give them a D8. You give them a D8. A date. Oh, that's adorable, Karafa. That's very cute. Well, hello and welcome to Bill Allen World. I am Wizzy the Wizard. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and... Also watch videos that are over there. Tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and watch other shows featuring Bill. He made me say that because he's a narcissist. Okay, bye. <laughs>